All right, guys, welcome to Wide Awake News Radio on this Wednesday, the 8th day of May. May's already flying by. Gorgeous, sunny day in Montana, as I know it is uh, in Idaho as well. And in just a minute, I'm bringing up Idaho because our guest, uh, William Grigg, is going to be joining us. The, and that's where he's located, and we got some warm weather, and I'm kind of excited about it. Uh, and uh, William, and, William and I will uh, continue that little conversation uh, here in a minute. But I, I uh, want to get everybody in the chat room, if you're not there already, wideawakenews.com. Click on the uh, radio microphone on our website. That will take you into the chat. If you want to watch me do this live, you can watch me do it live and a nice image of uh, William, uh, his avatar up there, through Justin TV. Uh, uh, the link, again, is at the chat room. I'm starting out the program with what I was talking about last night. I want to thank Gary Hendershot, who's uh, right now working for free for me, uh, uh, producing this program to put it up on... Uh, later up look on uh, YouTube, as well as right now on Justin TV, as well as the Next News Network, uh, and I appreciate his uh, support uh, every single night. Karen Quinto Stato, who uh, does a fantastic job scheduling, uh, and also hosts uh, Karen's Corner every Friday night. Thank you very much. And my lovely sister Bonnie, who is our webmaster at WideAwakeNews.com, who works tirelessly every single day for absolutely nothing, uh, only in order to spread the truth that she shares my love of. And that is the topic of tonight's uh, commentary video I put out. The truth. The truth. We need to embrace it. We need to hold on to it. We, regardless of how monotonous, regardless of how redundant, how boring, how uh, routine it may seem, regardless of how much we want to uh, jump inside the, uh, the pop culture and how we want to be uh, infotained, we must continue to press the truth. Why? Why? Well, I think it's simple. I, I have a question, and, and I'm going to bring, bring William, William on right now. I, 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 you can watch the rest of the, the commentary video I'll put out later that answers this question in my own thought. But, William, I really respect, respect your opinion and your point of view, and I think you're a very learned individual, and I want to get your take on this. Uh, question for you, William. William Grigg, uh, <laughs> free, uh, freedominourtime.blogspot.com is a website. We'll put that link in the chat. William, are, welcome back to the program. Are we seeing government tyrannical government starting to collapse on itself. Well, first of all, Charlie, thank you so much for having me on again and for your kind words. And I do think that we've reached a point, as a matter of fact, I think we reached this point several years ago, <clears throat> where the government that rules us is becoming a political singularity so dense that nothing can escape. And I like at that, that point, of course, it does collapse on itself. I think we passed the event horizon in 2006, which was when the Congress of the United States repudiated the, the indispensable civil liberties guarantee called habeas corpus. And, of course, there were some modifications made to the act that was passed in 2006, and there have been some equivocations about it. But we, with the NDAA and other measures of that kind, right. have reached a point now where it's just assumed that any one of us can be detained indefinitely, imprisoned indefinitely, without legal recourse and without any protection for due process on the whim of the President of the United States or some designated functionary, and that this right to detain us, of course, encompasses as well the supposed authority of the President summarily to execute us. And this is really the terminal phase of tyranny. We've not yet, of course, reached a point where the skies are clotted with drones and people are being dragged out of their homes to detention camps in the middle of the night, but all the necessary mechanisms are there. And more importantly, perhaps, the necessary claims of supposed authority are there. And it has been the case historically that when a society reaches that point, that the state has overwhelmed civil society to such an extent that you end up with something that doesn't sustain itself very much longer. Yeah. And concomitant with that, I'd point out that in 2008 we saw an October Revolution that was at least as consequential as what happened in October of 1917, when the entire political establishment in the United States made it clear that there was nothing that they were not willing to do in order to indemnify the bad debts and fraudulent practices of Wall Street. And they made it the official policy of the United States government to redistribute everything that has been earned or saved and everything that will be earned or saved into the foreseeable future into the hands of politic politically connected elites within the banking system. Now, those two, those two things taken together, I think, uh, spell a society that has reached its terminal phase. And if this, as if this weren't sufficient to leave us with a sense of all-encompassing doom, I just noticed <laughs> that the Jody Arias trial 
concluded with a guilty verdict, and yes. outside the courtroom there in Arizona was a was a little knot of knuckleheads chanting USA, USA, <laughs> which seems to be the default effusion on the part of people who have nothing left to cling to but this collective identity as something supposedly patriotic that actually yeah. is a type of curdled nationalism. That seems to be the expression of first resort uh, for people who have no sense of themselves as individuals, let alone any sense of what genuine patriotism consists of. So uh, we're in deeply and perhaps incurably dire trouble. <laughs> well, I can listen to you all night, cause, and, and I wrote down several things, but I'm going to start with the last comment uh, about the USA chant. That is the, the quintessential, uh, you know, when I hear that, when, when I see that, it's a quintessential uh, duh moment. You know, it's a quintessential. I, I don't know what to, I don't know what else to say. I don't know what else to do. So I'll start chanting USA. You know, and, and we and you know we saw it uh, uh, break out uh, when you know we when when Bin Laden was allegedly gotten kicked off the side of an aircraft carrier. You, you see it. You know when they when they lock down a city in Boston uh, and implement martial law uh, exactly. and, and and kick people's doors in and completely violate their freedom violate everything that every principle of uh, of this country is supposed to stand for and we chant USA it is the 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 absolute pig pin moment i i don't know how else to you know when i when i hear that it literally makes me cringe now, let me let me re 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 uh, repeat this to you ndaa habeas corpus due process execution tyranny 2008 financial collapse debt wall street banking system ultimate corruption these are just a few things I wrote down in, in just a few minutes of you speaking there. And, and the reason that I wrote them down and I'm repeating them is because it goes to the point of uh, tonight's topic, at least I want to start off with, which is embracing the truth. Because everything yeah. you just said, everything you just said there is 100% is accurate and it's been said over and over and over and over again to the point where people who are fed a constant diatribe of infotainment no longer want to hear that. They no longer want to be bored with the monotonous, with the routine, with the mundane. But it is paramount because we get caught up as a nation in things like this trial or in things like Benghazi, but we got to focus and remember that it isn't one singular event. It's a culmination of tyrannical acts, and we mm -hmm. have to keep uh, pounding that uh, drum. And it all has to do with the repudiation of the rule of law and the cultured forgetfulness on the part of the public as to what the rule of law actually means. Most people assume that the rule of law consists, as Saddam Hussein put it, of two lines above the signature of a decider, whether you're talking about the Iraqi ruler or whether you're talking about the chief executive of the federal government of the United States, who occupies a position that doesn't resemble the constitutional presidency in any noticeable way anymore. I mean, you've yes, got sir. a short-term elected dictator who has plenary authority rather than derivative authority to carry out the modest function of seeing that constitutionally appropriate laws are faithfully executed and to serve basically as a Walmart greeter for our country to do business overseas. That's what the president was supposed to be. The president was not supposed to be a monarch, he wasn't supposed to be a potentate, and he wasn't supposed to be a commander-in-chief, except in those limited circumstances where Congress actually declares war right. and activates the military. And the military itself was not supposed to be an establishment. The, the Navy, admittedly, was to have some permanence, but the Army could be disbanded every two years or so because the founders understood from dire experience that they had better not establish an entity that could be used for the purpose of internal security. In other words, to have the type of situation that we had in Boston, the cradle of liberty, yeah. where you had people who are in no recognizable sense the heirs of the colonial patriots cheering as you had... Uh, almost, in a satanic, uh, almost in a satanic... Uh, a twist Inversion. of reality uh, yeah, on Patriots Day. On Patriots exactly. Day. You know? Yeah, uh, that's one of those little jokes that are arranged by history, random chance, or something more sinister. Right. You have a complete inversion of something that is held, if not as sacred, or at least as notable by, by people of genuine patriotic impulses. And that, that's so a perfect tough. summation of where we are right now as a country. William, we'll, we'll pick up this conversation on the back side of this break. Uh, we'll be back with William Griggs and more Wide Awake News Radio. In just a minute, please hang tight. Yes, welcome back to Wide Awake News Radio on this eighth day of May, Wednesday. Uh, freedom in our time, 
dot blogspot dot com. That's uh, uh, William Griggs' uh, website. Please go there, bookmark it, and check out his work. Uh, always, uh, always fascinating work, and always a fascinating interview. Uh, and w- let's continue the conversation. You know, I was talking, I was la- labeling off all these things that that you covered, which a lot of people, even even here, William. I mean, you know, night not nightly, but occasionally, I'll get an email or somebody in the in the chat. You know, that, why are we covering this stuff again? It's critical. It, it is beyond critical that we keep the pressure up, especially uh, when we see uh, chinks in the armor. And, and you know, mm-hmm. the, Benghazi, the Benghazi things back out today, uh, in this video I put out tonight, I said, this is important. It, it shows lies. It shows corruption. Yeah. It shows deceit. However, you know, the, the political hay that's trying to be made in D.C. by the opponent or the opposition team is that this is going to bring down the administration. And let's be really clear, there is no administration difference. If, it, if, it, if uh, Obama goes out, Biden comes in, or uh, the next Republican comes into line uh, to replace this one, we're not getting a change. We're getting the exact same thing. The truth is the, only, the, con- the consistent truth that uh, the, total, the uh, whole uh, uh, republic has been corrupted and uh, occupied and uh, usurped. That truth is what needs to be pushed if we want a chance for freedom. Well, one part of that truth, of course, is that we're dealing with political factions that are entirely fungible. There's no material difference between an Obama and a George W. Bush in terms Singularity. of policy. Your domestic, yeah, exactly, your domestic yeah. policy. The only difference is that the successor tends to amplify the crimes of his predecessor, which is why under George W. Bush you had people being indefinitely detained. He had the occasional drone strike against somebody who was identified as a Al Qaeda leader or a terrorist militant. That's a large, of course, and infinitely self-replenishing pool because the definitions are so vast. Right. But under Obama, you have this institutionalized to the point where he can murder a 16-year-old U.S. teenager because they don't like the politics of the father. Yeah. And this oh. is something that they did. They've never apologized for it, according to Robert Gibbs, the former spokes liar for the White House. The reason why this happened was because Abdel Alawaki's father was irresponsible. That was the answer that he was willing to provide when he was confronted about that crime. So you're dealing here in Barack God, Obama sick. with somebody who's the impenitent murderer of children, and there are dozens or scores or hundreds of children who are being murdered every week in Pakistan by drone strikes. Michelle Obama, promoting civilian disarmament in this country, gave an interview with one of her media courtiers on CBS uh, this morning on Sunday, in which she talked about the idea that there are American children who live in the constant fear of death. And, of course, she's referring to people who live in that haven of civilization and egalitarianism called Chicago, which has the most restrictive gun laws in the country. Right. And she was saying that we have to infringe upon the rights of law-abiding people to arm self-defense because there are American children who are living under this constant Damoclean sword of, of early demise. And if she were really as exercised about the prospect of children living under the fear of death as she professes to be, she would nudge the murderer sitting next to her or sleeping next to her in bed and say, you really should stop killing people with drone strikes in Pakistan, where they're cultivating enmities that eventually are going to blossom into terrorism in a nuclear-armed Muslim country of 180 million people. And that illustrates a point that I think we cannot ignore or understate, and that is that government is the only human enterprise that profits through failure or through perceived failure through crisis and catastrophe. By failing to provide the services that it advertises, government enriches itself. Whether you're talking about what happened on September 11th of 2001, where, according to the standard narrative, we were attacked by this hostile, implacably hostile foreign force that irrationally hates us because we're free, but (laughs) despite the literally trillions of dollars spent on a vast and in sprawling military apparatus, national security state, federal law enforcement agencies, intelligence agencies, and so forth, you had this horrible episode where thousands of Americans were killed, and since that time, trillions of dollars have been spent to enhance the power of the government to do exactly the same things that were the prelude to what happened on September 11th. The biggest difference is now they're overtly targeting the population of the United States as the enemy. And that's a pretty good thumbnail sketch of what government does and how government prospers. Well, and, and, and it's that thumbnail, William, it's the thumbnail that that, that message, what you just said there in three minutes, that that is above and uh, beyond the, 
the the moment, the pop culture moment of the headlines. That that <laughs> thumbnail is what needs to be repeated, and and it's effective, and it is and it is turning the, it is turning the tide. You know, uh, uh, it's easy to be pessimistic talking uh, uh, the things that we talk about all the time. But yeah. if we step back and look at the thumbnail uh, that you just provided, we see that there are more people that, that do not believe establishment media. We see that, you know, when an event like Boston happens, look, everybody listen to me right now. Think about this for a minute. When Boston occurred, did you or were you or were you not surprised at the so-called uh, sheeple, uh, and I don't say that disparagingly, <laughs> but the so-called sheeple who questioned the event? I was I, I, I was questioned. I, I mean, I was shocked at people that I would say are just mainstream, believing everything that comes across the radio or the television, questioning uh, this doesn't seem right. They, they're questioning the official line, uh, and, and it is a proven fact that the, the majority of the population no longer trust uh, uh, establishment media propagandists uh, to get their information. So that thumbnail is critical because it points the overall, it, it paints the overall uh, destiny of our nation. It's interesting to consider mass entertainment, television in particular, as the equivalent of communion in a government-ordained religious system, if you will. Yes. The yeah. cult of the state, of course, uses television as a device of communion. What's really interesting is that in just the last couple of months, there have been a number of industry analysts who have been William, hold on one that sec. Americans... I, okay. Hold on one sec. I don't, I don't want to catch you off in the middle of a good story, so or in the good... Uh, 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 speech you're going to give us here, and I, and I want to hear it. So we're going to be back with William Gick, Greg, more Wide Awake News Radio. Hang tight. The uh, uh, gaseous anomaly or something. No, we had a power failure. The singularity. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and you are live. We're live. Okay, welcome back to Wide Awake News Radio. Charles McGrath, William Grigg, uh, having a little technical issues there during the break and talking a little bit of Star Trek during the break. And it's, uh, you know, on this topic of, uh, of keeping the truth present, uh, and and culture in general, and the shift in culture. Uh, when, do do you want to do you want to rehash that story on uh, on Star Trek? I mean, you know, I, 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 I'm a fan of sci-fi too, and I really did enjoy uh, the that I think it was 2009, the latest one with the new characters and all that. I thought it was kind of gritty the way they shot it, uh, and and I liked it. I thought it was a good story. But you yeah. told me something interesting during the break that I think uh, is. Uh, is a, a obvious momentum shift in uh, in people's reality. Well, at the risk of doing injury to his career, I'd like to point out that Roberto Orsi, who's the co-script writer of the most recent Star Trek film in 2009 and then Star Trek Into Darkness, which comes out in about a week and a half, is a huge Ron Paul fan and also a very outspoken critic of the national security state, particularly the CIA. Mm -hmm. And I subscribe to his Twitter feed, and what's really interesting is how frequently he will post links to things that would be considered countercultural uh, critiques of the Homeland Security Department, the TSA, U.S. foreign policy. He's very much opposed to the wars of empire mm -hmm. and democracy propagation. He was a big supporter of Ron Paul, which I found quite interesting. There are a number of people really among the 30-something, early 40-something so-called creative community in Hollywood who are fans of Ron Paul because I think they've become somewhat jaded by the fact that they're constantly immersed in the politically dictated fantasies that they're forced to propagate. But the new Star Trek film, from what I understand, having read some reviews of it, it comes out, I believe, today in Great Britain and Australia and a number of other countries. A number of the critics have been unkind to it because, uh, in, to paraphrase closely one review, uh, there's a truth or allegory involved about the way that governments will exploit crises in order to enhance their powers at the expense of liberty and truth. And specifically, apparently, there is a through line in the new story that deals with the way that people in power collaborate covertly with terrorist threats. It's something that Frederick Bastier, the brilliant 19th century French economist and parliamentarian, described as governments creating the poison and the antidote in the same laboratory. Mm -hmm. And more recently, people were described as the principle of somebody being a firefighter who moonlights as an arsonist. That's pretty much the <laughs> mechanism that governments use to consolidate their power. And apparently the new film deals with that. 
And this is the subtext of this film. And I think that it's quite interesting that they would spend $200 million on a movie that's being promoted globally in the hope of bringing in a billion dollars or more in worldwide box office. That a vehicle this big and this prestigious, the tentpole for Paramount, of course, this summer, would be willing to traffic in those ideas which are completely verboten as far as the people who are the self-appointed cultural commissars are concerned. Yeah. And they, they really undermine very diligently cultivated false consensus of which the television industry is a big part. As I mentioned before the break, if you take a look at our society as a state-run cult, television would be the instrument of communion. And in recent months, there have been a number of studies, frantic studies, put out by people who were involved in cable television, broadcast television, expressing concern that young adults are no longer consuming television with quite the ardor that their parents had because of the proliferation of media sources and entertainment options. And so they're unchurching themselves, if you will. They're falling out of communion with the state-ordained electronic church. Mm -hmm. And that's encouraging. It's one of those things that have been... Uh, discussed for a number of decades here. What will we happen when the proliferation of media really makes it difficult for the people who want to fuse our country into one collectivist monolith to do so? You know, what a horrible thing this would be. I was talking with people about this 20 years ago when I'd attend UN conferences and events of that kind, and I'd be in the company of would-be social engineers who were fretting about that possibility and say, what, what is the problem here exactly? You know, let the ideas compete. Isn't that really the whole concept behind what our country yeah. is supposed to be. But the, free exchange of information. They, the free exchange yeah, of information and idea is the most powerful weapon, period. That's it. Yeah. it, it it's, the, also what, most, it's also the most powerful deterrent to ter- tyranny, uh, and it's exactly. also the biggest threat. Yeah, that, they do not want ideas to proliferate. They do not want a diversity of, genuine diversity of ideas to be available. What they want, of course, is to find ways of turning us into the type of automata who would chant USA, USA, yes. USA at the slightest provocation. Yes, and and stand up, and I, I, you're talking about this, and, and I had a conversation with a friend of mine this morning. Dear man, you know, he's, he's my friend, uh, but the, sub, the subject got on the Second Amendment, and it was, mm. you know, the, the words that were uttered, uh, chalkboard, fingernails on the chalkboard, what does somebody need uh, 40 rounds or 30 rounds for uh, to go deer hunting for? And, you know, I, and I hear that, and I don't hear him. You know, I care about him. Uh, but what I hear is conditioning. And what mm-hmm. I hear is uh, the, uh, the canned uh, uh, news cycle trying to convince the people that we, uh, that we should think a certain way. And when the topic is brought up, we are uh, given an immediate USA chant type answer. <laughs> I find myself irresistibly led to say that there's a Star Trek episode that describes this. You might remember the episode Return of the Archons about a totalitarian society. You are a fan. <laughs> I am. I'm an inveterate yeah. Trek dork. That's I, right. That's, I was, that. that's cool. But the, the planet was ruled by a computer that had set up an ersatz religion where people were controlled to the point where they were utterly torpid and pacified except for one day every year when there'd be this Saturnalia of violence and sexual assault called yep. Festival. And Landry, as it turns out, was a computer. What would happen is that people would be assimilated into this collective to become members of the body. And once they had been mind-wiped by Landrew, they were expected to recite with a type of, of dull and, and soporific earnestness all these catchphrases that they had been said. And that's how you know if somebody was one of the body, if you're a member of the body. You cannot tell me that we live in a society that's that far removed from that dystopia when people are expected to regurgitate these potted platitudes and soundbite certitudes about things such as gun violence, despite the fact, as was pointed out yesterday, gun violence has been radically declining over the past 20 years. Absolutely. What, 33% or so? It's huge. It's down from 93 to, to 2011. Uh, six points. I'm off the top of my head. I did a video on it long, long, long ago. Six point six people killed by gun violence per hundred thousand in 1993. In 2011, that number was three point six percent. So it's it's almost in half. But it doesn't yeah. stop the canned uh, the canned response. And something very similar has happened with respect to fatalities of police officers in the line of duty. That that rate has been plummeting since the mid 1960s, and it's 
a very rare incident indeed when you see a police officer who is violently killed on the line of duty. has happened, unfortunately, in the aftermath of the Boston shooting under circumstances that are still by no means clear. Dubious. But we are, of every time a police officer dies in the line of duty, we're subjected to this Brezhnevite spectacle of thousands of uniformed police officers converging on the scene, and we're supposed to find ourselves prostrate with grief that a public citizen has heroically died on our behalf. When you can round up to never the circumstances in which a police officer actually dies in the line of duty protecting life, liberty, or property. But they're state functionaries, you see. They are part of the exalted priesthood of government-sanctioned coercion. And for that reason, their every deed has to be immortalized, and their deaths have to be sacralized and treated as these episodes of officially mandated public mourning. Yeah. The thing is, if you take a look at people in the productive sector who do dangerous jobs, people are construction workers or commercial fishermen or loggers, farmers for that matter, they all have far higher rates uh, of yeah. job-related fatalities. Yes. And they're never celebrated. There was a mining collapse in Utah not long ago where several dozen miners were killed. That's a very dangerous job. They're creating original wealth. They're not, of course, treated as the type of people whose death should be immortalized in the way that a police officer. We, we would. don't we don't throw a ribbon on our chest and uh, do an Instagram saying "Remember in Boston, remember in uh, uh, Utah when uh, when we lose uh, people who are like you said productive." Exactly. We're gonna, we, you know, we'll, uh, we'll continue this conversation on the back side. I want to when we come back since we're keeping on the uh, uh, on the movie theme, the movie Priest. If mm. you it, you made me. Pop that into my, it popped into my head when you were talking. I want to talk about that when we come back with William Grigg and more Wide Awake News Radio. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Wide Awake News Radio. William Grigg is our guest as we continue our conversation. This is our last segment, William. I'm, I'm sad. <laughs> I, like to, I like talking with you. Uh, this, is our last this, first, yeah, this is our last segment in the first hour, uh, uh, for the first hour, rather. Coming up in hour number two, uh, we have our friends from... Uh, <coughs> Excuse me, Austin, rare coin and bullion. Gabe Elton, great mm. to get him back on, and uh, I'm going to pick his brain because uh, we, we've uh, we've seen some controversy in the metal markets, obviously, and there's all kinds of things coming out. You know, again, uh, buried in in uh, sensationalism about uh, uh, the the Chinese looking at uh, a, a play against the dollar. What does this all mean for precious metals? This is what we'll cover uh, in in hour number two. Conti- let's continue this. We la- last segment. I really, you know, once in a while it's nice to, to, to step off of uh, course here. And, and, you know, as I said to you during the break, there certainly is um, a, a, a shift and, or maybe even more of a, of a move toward reality from, uh, from the pop culture. And I, I know that's, that's, that's probably people are cringing right now because we all turn into voice, dancing with stars, all that stuff, all that mindless stuff. But there is, you talked about the youth, right? The, mm-hmm. the youth of the nation that are so completely, I hate the word, but it's accurate, disenfranchised uh, on uh, self-governance. And more of them are waking up and becoming uh, uh, a, a driving force in pushing some uh, uh, of the so-called establishment media, establishment entertainment, to the direction of, uh, of what we call the truth movement. Uh, and I, I, let me give you this, and then uh, because I told you I wanted to to bring up the movie Priest, I agree with your analogy one thousand percent when you talk about the media. You know, Goebbels uh, invented it; we perfected it. Uh, but it is a, a deity almost. It is uh, deified. It is used as as a religious weapon, and and uh, or a religious uh, uh, wrangling rather. And it reminded me, when you were talking about that, the movie Priest, which personally I thought was a horrendously horrible movie. However, the big mega city, the big mega government that controls the civilized part of the planet, and its enforcers were, uh, you know, and of course the, the, the city was controlled by, I'm assuming it was a, a play on the Catholic Church, but uh, the enforcers were priests, and these are folks who are above the law, they're above uh, uh, reproach, above question, and they're the death uh, death dealers of uh, the government, and uh, this is, I think, a good analogy to what we look at now with the whole chant in USA, the whole uh, put on a, a ribbon for uh, you know somebody in the line of duty, 
And really, the duty, the people who are pulling their duty are the folks who made, uh, hopefully, the non-GMO food that's on your table tonight. This, this is the duty, the people who are raising their kids. I mean, these are the people really doing their duty. Uh, please, please continue with that thought or, or your observation on that thought. I didn't see that film, but it does sound as if it's trafficking some really interesting ideas that are fairly commonplace in yeah. some of the science fiction that I enjoy that is meant to be social commentary that is rooted in history and then appreciative of inv- developing trends in contemporary society. Another example of what you're describing, I think, would be the short live television show Firefly, which dealt with a Love that somewhat, show. Yeah, <laughs> dystopian society in the 25th or 26th century that's a fusion of the Anglo-American Imperium and yep. China. And that really is an interesting projection, and the result is, of course, you have a, a completely ruined world and this galaxy-spanning empire that is broadly inhospitable to any kind of private enterprise or any kind of individual initiative. And that television show was replete with wonderful moments where people would comment about the the leaden and futile uh, existence of this entity called government. And people were reduced to stealing to make a living because yes. the government that ruled them was so all-encompassing. This is the alliance, as it called it. The thing that I find interesting about what's happening now with the media, and social media in particular, is that on one hand you could say that there's a certain self-preoccupation on the part of youth who, rather than consuming media products, are producing media products that focus on themselves. Perhaps that's one reason why you have so much so-called reality television that's uh, cluttering primetime programming. I consider that to be an oxymoron. You change the nature of behavior when you put a television camera or a film camera in the room. Right. It's sort of like the observer effect in physics. Things just don't work out the same way if people know there's an audience. So we're not seeing reality. You're seeing people engage in play acting, albeit of an unscripted variety. But the thing that I find most heartening about the social media trend, of course, is that people in real time can undermine the efforts by the the gatekeepers and the consensus formers to tell us what we're supposed to think about things that are happening. There's, of course, a lot of stuff that happened with the Boston Marathon bombing that was driven by social media. And a lot of what's happening now in terms of challenging the prescribed narrative on Benghazi, which, as you point out, is an important story, albeit one that is being written by one partisan faction at the expense of another partisan faction. They do exactly the same things with power. But that's a heartening and encouraging thing, the fact that people can be their own publishers and make their views known. Anything that detracts from the monopoly or the cartel here on the part of the government and its opinion-forming class is a good thing and a welcome thing. It's not an unmixed blessing, of course. I don't want to say that this is something that is not without its downside. That being said, I think we must say as well that a program of this kind, you know, the one we're involved in this evening, probably couldn't have existed uh, 10 or 12 years ago. Right. And every time there's a, a green and, and delicate shoot of independent thought that penetrates the dull concrete of the official consensus, we have cause for optimism. Yeah, I, I, I concur wholeheartedly with that. And, uh, and like I said, it, it is easy to become uh, downtrodden with the, with the news that, that we talk about all the time and, and to see the progression of, uh, of you know, tyranny. Uh, I've been questioning this week with some really, you know, really great guys, yourself included, you know, the direction of, uh, you know, my fear is, of course, uh, immediately is for my my boy, my my son, yeah. who's who's looking at uh, you know a, a, a life of potential, uh, you know, being tried to push into military service for uh, uh, illegal wars and a continued uh, uh, expansion of our tyrannical state to the point where I'm you know he he's being entered into a Stasi style police state, but uh, you know I, I do even though that is a major concern that that truly I think about every single day of the week and, and that's not uh you know that, that's not an uh, uh, that's an understatement of anything um i do hold out hope in his generation it, it, you mm-hmm. know uh because you know it, it was there was a time where the youth were liberal the oldies like us were conservative and, and every you know and everybody made the switch but the bs for lack of uh, being able to describe it as better as good as you can the bs is starting to uh, wear through and and I think it's uh, it's saturating 
uh, all levels, all uh, age groups, and all socioeconomic scales, because uh, you can only, you know, I, I said this in my video earlier, and I'll turn it over to you for the remainder of, of your hour. Uh, I said this in my video earlier. Why is, why are we looking at potentially a, a breakdown, a breakdown of this government? Because you can, you can wrap yourself in the truth every single day, and you might bore the heck out of people, but the truth is going to be the truth. You're never going to have to excuse it. You're never going to have to verify it. You're never going to have to uh, come back and change history in order to fit the facts. But what we're seeing happening on a daily basis to humanity in, in general, not just the United States, but in the in the control government around the world, is the unraveling of their corruption. They no longer have this stranglehold on reality. To paraphrase one of my favorite songwriters, you can shift perspective, but reality won't budge. And one <laughs> of the very useful things about what's going on economically, of course, is that you're seeing in the realm of precious metals the fact that uh, people... Uh, once we account for all of the tugiversations and the speculative markets and hedges and people who are investing in paper, uh, securitized precious metals investments, factoring all that out, the fact is that gold, if you want to personify gold, is just sitting in the corner with its arms folded looking with something other than amusement at the antics of people who run central banks, saying, no, this is the reality check. I am the reality check. It's not that I'm growing more valuable. It's that what you're putting out is depreciating. It's, in other words, something that can't be avoided. There is a certain ineluctable reality here that we have to embrace, which is that when the Federal Reserve generates fiat currency at the volume that it does, the result is that the currency becomes worthless. And last week, of course, the people who are in charge of feeding us what we're supposed to believe to be the truth on Wednesday said that we were dealing, of course, with a very disappointing jobs figure that we're 80 or 90,000 jobs below what would be necessary in order to maintain the current employment contour. And this, of course, is a lie because unemployment's actually around 22 or 23 percent, if it were honestly calculated. Yes. But they were willing to admit that the jobs report was disappointing. And I said on Wednesday when they came up by Friday, they'll say that it's unexpectedly strong. And sure enough, that happened, and the Dow crested 15,000. That was it was propelled entirely, of course, on the on the strength of delusion and monetary inflation. Yeah. And yet people were programmed to say that this means that the economy is growing stronger. We can go out and spend more money that we don't have. We can go out and contract more debt that we can't afford. All these things because of this ersatz reality that's being created with respect to the economy. And meanwhile, as I say, gold just sits in the corner saying, "No, I'm I've been what I've been for thousands of years." And I am the baseline here against which your currency is being measured and found wanting. And it's yeah. not just, of course, in precious metals and financial circles where you have reality checks of that kind. Uh, in every endeavor the government's involved in, you're dealing with force and fraud. And the really heartening thing is that owing to social media and the decentralization of opinion, people are starting to understand that government is nothing more than the institutionalization of aggression rooted in fraud. That is something that once is thought, you cannot unthink. Once you see it, you cannot ignore it. And that's becoming viral. And that's the biggest source of encouragement for me in current affairs. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, you know, and, and maybe I'll title this video tonight, Gary, uh, the reality check, because, uh, uh, you know, people are, uh, in fact, doing that. They're, they're, they're seeing that the, uh, the solid foundations, you know, and you're talking about precious metals there, but in life in general, right? Truth and, yeah. and uh, freedom. Those are starting to be questions. William Grigg, thank you. Always a pleasure to have you on here. Uh, I greatly appreciate your time and your eloquence. Freedominourtime.blogspot.com is his website. Please go there and uh, support him uh, any way you can. William Grigg, thank you very much. I appreciate you coming on. Have thank a you so minute. much, Charlie. You Take bet, care. Jane. And enjoy your overly, uh, overly warm weather. We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> I sure will. <laughs> All right. Okay, stay tuned. We're going to be back with Gay Belton. We're going to find out what's going on with metal, right? We're going to find out uh, what, the, what the experts are saying and what the supply is. Uh, we'll be back with Gay Belton of Austin Coins and Bullion and more Wide Awake News Radio. Just a minute. Hang tight.